Well, hello, we're here in Chicago with Professor Ilaria Ramelli, and uh, we are incredibly grateful to you, Ilaria, for agreeing grateful to do to this. <laughs> um, Ilaria is reclined because we want her to be comfortable, and she has uh, severe scoliosis, so we're hoping that she'll talk longer yeah. because she's comfortable. Um, but uh, we had hoped that Ilaria would be able to come to our conference, but that seemed to be rather difficult, so we decided to fly here and meet her in Chicago, where she's uh, part of a North American Society on Patristics, yeah, yeah, some, yeah, something yeah, like that. Exactly. So uh, we're uh, very grateful for you, Ilaria, and for your work. And um, maybe, uh, well, I, I ought to mention, uh, Robin Perry is one of the speakers at our conference. Oh, great. Oh, I'm and uh, yeah. he, he interviewed you, uh, and it was a great oh, yeah. interview. So w after we had said, we'll fly out and meet you, I watched the interview and thought, oh, man, that was a great interview. So now we have you in living color, and you'll have to give us something you didn't say to Robin that's super extra special that will make him jealous because he's probably <laughs> watching this um, this right now so um, anyway um, maybe you could tell us uh, a little bit about your yourself we know I know that you're a professor from the Catholic University in Milan and I went online and it appears that you are a professor at almost every university <laughs> in the world. Is there a college or a university there where you're not a professor? <laughs> well, uh, I, I have both senior fellowship I, I've had and I'm currently having and of course a professorship. So uh, in senior fellowships, uh, uh, right now I had just one in Oxford, I had one in Durham. Uh, it's all on ancient philosophy and patristics mostly or theology, ancient philosophy and patristics. Uh, and uh, one in Milan, Milan is ancient philosophy, a Catholic university in Milan. Uh, been in Erfurt also uh, for religion, uh, as gushed professor in and senior fellow visiting uh, and also well uh, then also visiting professor in many places from Harvard to New York uh, Columbia and uh, Emory ma many many universities that also in in Europe and in North America and also in Israel also Tel Aviv and the Hebrew University uh, but um, yes uh, I teach I've been teaching for some years uh, in Michigan uh, and there is a, uh, is a professorship and, and chair in theology and and so uh, I've been, uh, uh, but I've been teaching also in many, that's, many, that's many amazing. places. I went to Grant Junior High. That's <laughs> what was my claim to fame. But uh, we're especially excited uh, to talk with you because of your recent work mm -hmm. on uh, apocatastasis and the Christian doctrine of apocatastasis and uh, the 911 page monograph. I thought 911 is a great number for a revolutionary book. How, how did you come to pick the doctrine of apocatastasis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, uh, this comes from, again, from, first of all, from the readings of the Father. So I was really trying to deepen um, this part of the ancient world because I see really patristics in general, early Christianity in general, and patristic philosophy in particular, because you cannot really divide philosophy from theology in the patristic time. So it's very important to keep them together. Um, I see all of this, so early Christianity, patristic theo philosophy and theology, as part and parcel of the ancient world, which I was studying since um, almost my childhood. So I studied classics a lot. I had a very, very, very long uh, training in classics six and two MAs, a PhD, a postdoc, etc., uh, in Milan mainly. Uh, and uh, um, so it's very important that even the philosophy and theology of the fathers are really, special patristic philosophy, uh, are really part and parcel of ancient philosophy, of ancient thought. So for me, it was a natural development of seeing what uh, what was the thought of uh, the ancient world, the great philosophers, and among these great philosophers, the Christians. And since I am Christian and, and uh, I've been deepening my faith uh, also very much on the cross, and this is an also a, a kind of mystical way to deepen your faith, even maybe in vitu, so against my will, but Jesus yeah. wanted to give he, it to me. Well exactly, yeah. so he enrolled me. <laughs> 
And so, uh, so this is why I wanted to explore also this Christian part of the ancient world. So I, I, I'm against this divide of classics on the one side, early Christianity on the other. This makes no sense at all. So it's all holistic. And so they are just reading and reading. I was, first of all, it was evident to me, as I was saying, that there is this very strong eschatological dimension in the thought of the father. So when they think, what is ideal? What is the ideal behavior? What is the ideal for the church? What we should do? How we should behave? How we should pray? What we should think of? They always refer to the telos, which is the end, the ultimate the perfection. end. Perfection. Exactly, yeah. and the blessed end, of mm -hmm. course. Uh, and so, um, so I, I wanted to, to see how this telos was considered. And of course, this is a bit different from uh, some strands of uh, uh, ancient Greek philosophy, for which the telos has no meaning, because they have a recurrency of time. So they have recurrent cycles forever. So the world is perpetual. It has no beginning, no end. And so the telos for them does not exist in, in a way. Uh, but for these fathers, of course, they were bound by the Bible. So they, they had to stick to the Bible as the great revelatory text. And then they interpreted it philosophically, but the great authoritative text for them is the Bible, clearly. And so in the Bible, they, they read about the end of the world. And, and so this is, uh, this is something different from thinking of an infinite succession of uh, eons or of cycles of temporal cycles. But all of our time is not just a repeti an infinite repetition of cycles, but is oriented toward the end. And, and this end, of course, this is the perfection. So I was so attracted to that because, first of all, it was something like thought-provoking to me to see that the fathers were uh, in many fathers. Of course, there are lots of nuances. I'm not, I'm not oversimplifying, but. Uh, uh, the fathers were really thinking of this tale, it's not at the end of the world like only the destruction, so, so to say in, in a negative way, but uh, the great fulfillment. So mm -hmm. it's not the world that has to end because God wants to destroy it or something, but, but because this is the fulfillment. And how this fulfillment works? Well, mo many fathers, and this struck me a lot uh, initially, also it was something like 20 years ago when I began this investigation. I, I've been actually working at the academic level very hard and interact for, for over 20 years. It's been 20 years of academic research and then, of course, of teaching, etc. So uh, it's a lot of work. And there was, I was seeing um, this kind of thought-provoking of bold ideal of theosis, what the Greek fathers called theosis, which means literally deification. Yeah. yeah. And one say, what does it mean, deification, so that we have to become God? And this is exactly what the fathers say, even though they, they are mostly not speaking in a substantial way. So they are not kind of being blasphemous in, in a way of suggesting that the, the divide between creator, God, and creatures will kind of disappear, of course. It's not that we become God but, in this. But God will fill all things. Exactly. But God will be all in all. And and this is the, the big uh, um, uh, kind of catchphrase, if you like. And the, this is really the text that, for most of the fathers, was also the, the ground uh, for apocatastasis. Yeah. The restoration of all things is the idea. We're showing this video at a, a conference that we're calling the Forgotten Gospel Conference, the deeper story of God's relentless love. And by forgotten gospel, we don't mean there's a gospel that yeah. secret gospel, but yeah, that there's yeah, only no, one gospel, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that the gospel is really summed up in the name Jesus, which means God is salvation. And we think, well, gosh, we think He's going to do it. So we, so we put, um, we kind of have two poles or two ideas that we committed to for the conference. One that scripture's authoritative, however yeah, you define absolutely. that. Yeah, yeah. And secondly, that God reconciles all things to himself, making peace by the blood of the cross, the Colossians passage. And then we just have invited people to come to the conference. So some people um, have, have come as hopeful of the apoca apocatastasis, yes. <laughs> and some as committed to the apocatastasis. Um, and, uh, but, but all of them probably having suffered a bit from it. And I think part of what they suffer with is this, this feeling like, am I alone? Am I a heretic? Does anybody else think this way? So, so you are kind of like a superhero to all of us because uh, nice the story. idea that, oh, hey, I, I'm not the first one that's this. I'm not alone. Someone else has seen this. So, so I, I, 
I'm excited to, to have you flesh it out a little bit. And then also, um, just to, just to I would just what would you say to them they're they've they've uh, are are they heretics are they alone um, is it I guess the, the big question for everybody is is it really true that that um, a majority of the of the fathers uh, were, were acceptable of this idea or even believe this idea so and so maybe you could um, address that and then yeah. maybe we can yeah. flesh out the so details. So the, the meaning of apocatastasis and the fathers on apocatastasis. So I first so, of so all some I people might not even know what we mean by the exactly, fathers. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So first let me let me uh, kind of warn. Uh, I am I am also a systematic theologian. I do teach across in Christology. I've taught, uh, but uh, I basically as for research I am a historical theologian. So my theology is mainly Mainly, my, my, my scholarship is in ancient philosophy, patristic philosophy, patristic theology, mainly the first millennium. Then, I, of course, I study also later, and Julian of Norwich, uh, Meister Eckhart, and so I arrive until uh, von Balthasar. But still, uh, my, uh, the great bulk, really, of my huge, huge scholarly work and, and uh, vocation, I would say, scholarly speaking, is really uh, historical theology of the first millennium. And so I speak from this historical perspective. and. Uh, from the perspective of how also the fathers were reading uh, the Gospels, of course, and the New Testament. And so let me see, first of all, that the very term apocatastasis is, is a Greek word, uh, and it comes from uh, the verb apokathistemi, uh, or apokathistano, which is a simplified uh, version of, of the regular verb apokathistemi, which uh, means uh, uh, I restore, mm, I, I restore, reintegrate, uh, to reintegrate great to restore um, and to return even sometime, but mostly rest restoration or reintegration is really the, uh, the meaning of apocatastasis. And uh, this term, of course, it has a, a very uh, wide uh, um, um, uh, currency, you say, in in uh, ancient Greek philosophy and in in everyday language, and and actually uh, well, one of the volumes of the trilogy that I, I was uh, speaking of for for the next uh, endeavor uh, is exactly on uh, Greek philosophical concepts of apokata. So that, that's to say, it was a, a Greek word very widespread. It was uh, used in many places, even in medicine, uh, such as a restoration to health uh, of a patient or uh, for an exile, a person who was exiled, the restoration into his or her fatherland, so uh, her, her birthplace or, or nation. So um, th there was, a, and, and one other uh, important meaning of this term uh, was the astronomical meaning, so uh, the return of the planets to their original position or configuration after a long cycle, a, a long uh, orbit and an old cycle of time. So it was a, um, a term that that had various applications in various fields. Uh, but what is also very important is that uh, uh, this term, uh, apocatastasis, uh, is uh, um, very much present in the Bible. The verb itself, this is present already in the Septuagint, uh, which is this Greek version of uh, the Old Testament, what we call Old Testament or Hebrew Bible. Uh, and uh, uh, in the New Testament, which is Greek, uh, uh, is extant at least in Greek, uh, then we have translation. So uh, in the New Testament, there is this passage in Acts uh, where St. Peter is speaking and is announcing uh, the resurrection of Jesus, actually, and then his second coming at the end of the world. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, and there he uses exactly uh, this term, uh, the very the very substantive uh, apocatastasis, uh, and uh, he says uh, Jesus basically will remain in heaven, or the heavens will keep him in, uh, literally, uh, until the times of uh, uh, of the restoration of all. This is uh, the the mechri um, chronon uh, apocatastaseo spanton. So the the times of the restoration of all, of which God had spoken uh, from time immemorial through the mouth of his holy prophets. Yeah. And, and, and here I, I read immediately a reference to Isaiah, for instance, when he's 
he says that in the end uh, the wolf and, and the lamb will sit yeah. together, etc. So this is uh, the idea of the restoration of all, and and this is also expressed uh, by Saint Peter in, in the speech of Luke, of course, of uh, the, the Acts of the Apostles, um, as in terms of the great anapsuxi, something like a, a comfort, a consolation that will come from God, and this consolation, this great uh, anapsuxi, which will come at the end of the time, will be universal restoration. And, and is it is it yeah. and with the fathers is it simply restoration or the idea of the telos as you were saying that you're arriving at a a state that you you weren't at, so it's more than a restoration exactly it's a exactly fulfillment. yeah that that was something I wanted to ask you that it, that I, I was reading David Bentley Hart you know oh. David Bentley Hart and he's, oh yeah I read the beauty of the infinite yeah, uh, yeah he's done well, very I, fine I, I yeah, only yeah, yeah, touched yeah. on it but it, he was talking it uh, it seems to be pretty influenced by Gregory of Nyssa and uh, seems to ground <laughs> the the the, uh, the doctrine of apo apocatastasis is uh, really part and parcel of the doctrine of creation ex nihilo is what he would Absolutely. what he would say so yeah. it, which i think is is uh, is mm. is a fascinating idea and i think that's what you're saying is mm. that correct yeah. that that that, it, that that the 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 beginning and the end it's all it's all part and parcel of the same thing which yeah, which would then make which is fascinating for me because then that means that uh, soteriology is part of your doctrine of creation and Absolutely. not. And, and a great proof of this, I would say, is the fact that those who support apocatastasis are all supporters also of the creatio ex nihilo. So then origin himself, actually he's well, there were other people who were supporting it, but Origen is very probably the first one who really gives a, a philosophical demonstration, uh, even using this argumentum ab absurdo, so, um, uh, from absurdity, uh, of the creation uh, ex nihilo, so that God really created everything from nothing. So, and I think and I think that w when we did this conference, that was the idea of the deepest story. So I, I felt like, at least in American evangelicalism, we've lost the deepest story, which mm -hmm. is the story of the Creator mm -hmm. creating us in His image and likeness, and we've gotten stuck on our will and our failure. So we've made the deepest story our failure rather than rather than God's success yeah. and a lot of a lot of people um, object to that idea because of the notion of, of free will exactly. and yeah. th what the fathers what I was reading the conclusion to your book what the father said about free will seems like that might be helpful information to the, to the discussion uh, that and it's, if you tell me if this is if I understand you correctly but Origen and Gregory they would argue that uh, when we choose evil, it's really not a choice in freedom. It's you'd mention it's like a, a mental illness, but when we choose the good, we choose the good in freedom, and we choose the good because God has revealed His grace. And so then you could say the story of God creating us in His image is the story of God creating a good free will within us, right? So, so it's the, so then we're predestined. For free will was yeah. is that what they're saying and i would say for the good of course there's yeah. there's no predestination pre to pre hell well, <laughs> yeah Prede predestin so the double yeah. predestination right. is a big so if, you, if you choose if you choose evil you're not free right yeah. exactly and this you know this is a uh, uh, first of all there, there are two things one is that most of the fathers were convinced of that so that the the Ethical intellectualism and the doctrine of apocatastasis are there in, in, in a great majority. And, and even Augustine and Basil, if it was Basil, uh, I don't think it's Basil, but the pseudo Basil or whatever, they are attesting both very clearly that the majority of the Christians in their time, so at, and fourth century, fifth century, were supporters of the doctrine of Protestant. So this is this is comes even not only from my own research from looking at the text, but even from the voices of those who later opposed this doctrine. Mm -hmm. So they they recognize this. And one big factor in this doctrine, of course, there are 
huge, many, many philosophical underpinnings of the doctrine of apocatastasis, and one is the ontological non-subsistence of evil, and there are many others. Yeah, I'm but going to one, ask you about that as well. Exactly, <laughs> but good. But uh, one very important is exactly this one, this notion of free will. Now, again, the fathers, as we're saying, uh, especially the, those uh, the Origenian tradition, the great supporters of this doctrine, were very much philosophically minded, and they were, all of them, mostly Platonists, so they are actually Christian Platonists. And so Socrates, as he is represented by Plato, was teaching exactly this, that evil is never chosen qua evil. So it's never chosen because it is evil, but it is always chosen by an obubilated mind, so it is always chosen by a defect of knowledge, by a defect of clear thinking, by a defect of intellect, uh, and it is chosen because it is mistaken for a good, but it is not good. And this is exactly the explanation that even St. Gregory of Nyssa, uh, late, who is a Christian Platonist in late 4th century, was giving for the fall, so for, for the original sin, so the, the head of all sins, and he was exactly explaining it in Socratic terms, in the terms of Socrates, which were the terms of Musonius Ruf, all the Socratic tradition, Platonic Socratic tradition, uh, which went into the Stoics also, so, which is this ethical intellectualism. He was saying, well, the forefathers, so Adam and Eve, the, the protoplasts, chose uh, to eat this forbidden fruit, and that was clearly an evil, because that was contravening the order of God, uh, that was clearly an evil. But why did they choose it? Because, not because it was evil. They chose it because they, it looked good. Yeah. So they, it seemed to them that it was Isn't good. Isn't that the wonderful thing in the story? They chose to eat it, but they didn't know good and evil, so they couldn't see the good to choose it, which yeah. is the beginning of the story of redemption and apocatas. Apocatastasis. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was Karl mm -hmm. Karl Barth that mm -hmm. defined God as the one who. If I'm, hope I'm remembering this correctly. The one who chooses the good in freedom. Mm -hmm. So to be made in His likeness is mm -hmm. to is to be able to choose the good in freedom. And so it, it seems to me that what they are, they are saying is that uh, when uh, apocatastasis is part of the doctrine of creation, that. God is in the business of creating us in his likeness by creating within us the capacity to choose the good in freedom. So God is speaking us into existence with his word, who is Jesus the Christ, and in a sense, we're witnessing our own creation in this world. And the fathers would argue that uh, God must be successful in his creation of a good free will within us, right? So th that's, that's what's exciting to me, because it seems to bring together the Calvinism that I grew up with, along with the Arminianism that were <laughs> that were yeah that were <laughs> that were yeah that were yeah, predestined yeah. for yeah. this good yeah. free will, yeah. and you know, and then Bart pulls the double predestination yeah. in with yeah. Christ uh, bearing bearing our curse. There, yeah. There's a fascinating uh, word that we spent some time studying at church because we were preaching through Ephesians in Ephesians 1.10 I started to learn about the word anakephalio mm. in Greek. Oh yeah, in this Greek. is also very important. And, and you, and you, a friend Mike sent me this quote from your book from yeah. page oh, 418. Yeah, good. You, you wrote, Gregory relies on origin for his core argument that the salvific submission of yeah. Christ oh, to yeah. the Father yeah. refers not to Christ's own divinity but to his body that is all human beings. And to me that Ephesians 1.10 has to do with that. Hmm. What, 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 could you tell us about that? Hmm. You know, this quote um, comes from Inillud Tunketipse Filius, which is, the interpre is a short work, but extremely important, both for the Christology of Gregory of Nyssa and for his soteriology and eschatology. Uh, and this short work shows very well two things. One is his dependence on origin, and then I will show, I will speak of that. And the other is uh, that it confirms that Gregor of Nyssa, just as origin before him, supported this doctrine of apocatastasis, which is all in that treatise, uh, in order to support orthodoxy against heresy. 
In this case, the heresy was the heresy of Arianism, or Neo-Arianism, as it's called, um, Eunomius, etc. But um, so the Arians, uh, again, in scare quotes, but le let us take the category. So the Arians uh, were interpreting the sentence in 1 Corinthians 15, 28, uh, when uh, St. Paul says uh, that the son will submit to the father that God may be all in all in the end. They were taking this submission to the father as a proof of their own position of the inferiority of the son to the father. Because they interpreted this submission in terms of the divinity of the son. So the divinity of the son is in a way inferior to the divinity of the father. So this means that the son is inferior to the father. Uh, and Gregory was uh, countering this, was objecting to that, uh, refuting this, and was saying, when St. Paul speaks of the submission of the Son, he is not uh, meaning the submission of the divinity of the Son, but the submission of the humanity of the Son, which is the body of Christ, because Christ has taken up all of humanity. And so when we speak of the humanity of the Son, really we mean all of humanity, all human beings uh, ever existed. So. Um, this is the interpretation, this is the exegesis, or the interpretation that Gregory gives of the words of Paul, which is an anti-Aryan interpretation and is an orthodox interpretation, Nicene interpretation. Now, uh, this is first is very important because when, when uh, it shows that Gregory was linking apocatastasis to orthodoxy, so to anti-Arianism, so to his orthodox support, uh, the support of the orthodox doctrine against the, uh, uh, the heresy of Arianism. He supports apocatastasis in this connection because he says that when the son will submit to the father in the end, this means that all humanity will submit to the father because this is the body of Christ, this is all humanity. But this submission is voluntary, so it's not a forced submission because free will is sovereign for them, origin they want everything to be voluntary. They don't. God doesn't want the forced submission of everyone and of anyone, even not even of the devil. If the devil converts, it must be a spontaneous, a voluntary conversion. So, uh, he's saying that this passage of Saint Paul shows that not the inferiority of the son, but to the contrary, shows the salvation of humanity in the end, because all humanity will submit to God voluntarily, and this means that it will be saved because. So the, the important thing is also that St. Gregory of Nyssa, so in this way, it's clear that he was supporting apocatastasis, because this is apocatastasis, uh, in a context of a defense of orthodoxy against heresy. So it's not that it's heresy, but it's actually in, yeah, in support show, of orthodoxy. Showing that the church fathers exactly, exactly. viewed apocatastasis as the, as as the orthodox, orthodox position. Absolutely, and grounded in scripture. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. to finish that thought, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you would, uh, up until mm -hmm. after Nicaea 325, mm -hmm. 350, mm -hmm. the predominant view in the early church was a was a view of uh, a view of apocatastasis. Yeah, of, and apocatastasis. it was still in the fifth century. Still, yeah. so still when Augustine was. Yeah, speaking. even even a, I heard you mention even Augustine, the early exactly. Augustine, yeah. uh, believed in the apocatastasis. Yeah. yeah, and then later on, when at least formally. He rejected it or pretended to the way we don't really know exactly, but still he's clear in writings that he is rejecting it. At least in his writing, he wants to show that he's rejecting it. Uh, then later on, he's still saying that that quam, that plurimi, so the, the vast majority of Christians were Do, believing. Yeah, even Augustine saying that in the fourth century. Exactly. So in, in the fifth, in yeah. the early fifth, so, even so the first half of the. To fifth. everybody sitting out there feeling like they are alone. The early church is with you, right? The early church, very, very. Of course, we we don't. I mean, we have these testimonies of Augustine. Then we have all the texts of the fathers, and and we can delve into. It. Of course, there were some who like Tertullian who didn't believe that he's a father, but he, I I don't love particularly Tertullian's great theological thoughts on the Trinity already, etc. But uh, so there are some fathers in in whom uh, in whose writings it's rather clear that they reject 
expected a Pocatastri, but there are, there are very few uh, where it's so um, clear, uh, and many, many others who are really either clearly in favor of it, uh, either in the hopeful form, or at least in the form for all humanities, other, other, uh, other um, include uh, really all creations, or yeah. the devil, the, the, the angel, others are concerned yeah. on, at least only with humanity, and maybe they don't uh, want to care about the devils or the demons, yeah. so to say, but still, uh, there are, uh, there's a number, a number, and, and then here also comes a very important linguistic issue that might appear maybe something like only for scholars, something like too technical, but in fact uh, impinges a lot, I mean, uh, bears a lot, a great deal uh, onto this issue, uh, because it's not absolutely enough, I mean, this is a, as a methodological statement, it's not enough that in a, especially in a Greek father, uh, you find the word Ionios uh, as usually translated as eternal in reference to the fire of hell or death or punishment or colasis Ionios, pure Ionion, uh, Thanatos Ionios, eternal death. It's not enough that you find that word maybe three or four times in a father. Uh, in, to say that this father rejected apocatastasis. That's absolutely, because this word Ionios is biblical, and it's used normally by Origen, Gregory of Nyssa, and, and they were supporters of apocatastasis. That means nothing. It's just a mistra mistranslation. Right. One thing that I'm really fascinated with, my background is yeah. in natural science with a bachelor degree in, right. in geology, yeah. which isn't yeah. much, yeah. but. But I have an appreciation for for physics and hmm. and the the implications of modern physics are astounding in terms hmm. of space and time and understanding of how time works and chronology. Yeah. Through through all the trauma I've been yeah. through yeah. theologically with my church, it's forced me to go back and examine a lot of those texts and the word Ionios. And uh, I'm intrigued by the idea that the the view of, of uh, the, the implications of modern physics on our view of space and time make it much more possible to to to, to read the Bible according to its original meaning. So, so you know, for the last what several hundred, hundred years, we've been kind of imprisoned with an Enlightenment way of thinking that all time is chronological yeah, yeah, and it yeah, continues yeah, yeah, just yeah, in a exactly, line. Yeah, yeah. And so, when yeah, we read yeah. that. Yeah. God is named I am, and before Abraham was I am, and that we're already seated in the heavenly places with Christ. The, the modern mind tends to think, oh, that's all metaphor. But now with a postmodern mind and postmodern physics, there are all sorts of opportunities, all, sort, all sorts of implications that are fascinating for scripture. Yeah. And, yeah. and one of my frustrations in reading material on the word eternity is we don't even understand what it means in English, let alone <laughs> in Greek. So, yeah. so eternity, eternity can mean um, a, a, an endless succession of chronological time to some people. To other people, it means no time, which is the exact exactly. opposite. Yeah. Yeah. Or the, metaphors, the implications yeah. of physics. You know, if you travel at the speed of light, all of time is e present in an eternal now. When I go back to the word Ionios, it's fascinating to me that the word seems to be used in in, in a variety of ways. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, but the implications yeah. for the yeah. for the Ionios fire and so what I picked up from you, Ilaria, yeah. and you yeah. tell me if I'm getting yeah. this, is yeah. that that Ideos seemed to be uh, used more in reference to endless chronological time, mm -hmm. and Ionios was a word that um, c could be used in in different ways and. Yeah in exactly. different places. Yeah, exactly. well, well, this is this is my really big question, okay? Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I've, I've done a lot of thinking about the, the six days of creation mm -hmm. and the seventh day as being um, a, a picture of all space and time, and I have reasons for saying that from physics and all, and the seventh day as being mm -hmm. a picture of the uh, uh, apocatastasis. Yeah. Oh yeah, these and the fathers uh, had a lot Do of they talk about that? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Okay, well, so this is yeah. so fascinating for me, because I don't, are you aware of, uh, a uh, physicist named Gerald Schroeder. He's in. He's in Israel. He's. Mm. But, but th th this is. Yeah, you, you, the yeah. implications are so wonderful because he says, mm. you know, because of relativity, mm. if you're standing from the a reference point of the Big Bang and you were to look at the Earth, that mm. that not metaphorically, but actually, mm. um, the age of the universe from the standpoint of the background radiation would be about six days old, mm. which is utterly fascinating when you get to Genesis chapter one and you think. 
oh, could we be living in the sixth day, which is the day of anakephalio and theosis and God making us in his, his likeness, on the edge of this eternal seventh day, which, and the door to that seventh day is Jesus crying, it is finished on the cross. And you know, St. Paul talked about how the eons, um, we, we come to the end of the eons in Jesus, um, which, which to me is, there are utterly fascinating ideas that, well, what is the, is the apocatastasis, you could say, the other side of the Big Bang, the, the other side of space, and time, and we're in this. So, did the fathers speak about that? Mm. Yeah, there are there are two two important things. One is all this speculation about the sixth day, the seventh day, and some, sometimes even the eighth day, uh, and and you find it in Be, because Maximus the because confess. the eighth day is like a continual seventh day, right? The exactly. Con- is 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 the real eternity outside of time yeah, forever? Yeah, yeah. So this is, and linked to that is the concept underlined very much by the Greek philosophical fathers, uh, such as Origen, but also Eugena, who is following him a lot, uh, and he was really a Neoplatonic philosopher, is the idea that only God is really eternal. So nothing else and nobody else is eternal. So what does this mean? God is the good, is life, so this means that life is really eternal, the good is eternal. But the opposite of that, death, evil, it's this so cannot temporal. be eternal yeah. because God is eternal. And, and what God is, is eternal, but not the opposite of God. And so this, this is also all the, um, the metaphysical implications of the notion of good attached to God and evil as Privation, privation right, of good. And so evil is not a kind of, like in the Manichaean idea, is a kind of equal to God, but is only privation, is only negativity. And Gregory of Nyssa was saying, God wanted us to taste evil, to, to uh, get a repulsion for that, finally. And so turn back to God. And, and so this is, uh, and also there is a wonderful um, kind of syllogism, so an argument, a philosophical argument that origin develops. Uh, and, and this is very strong. And, and, and this also makes me think that when Basil was going against this, this is not the true Basil because Basil knew origin very well. So anyway, so in this syllogism, in this uh, argument, which is a kind of Aristotelian argument, uh, uh, origin is saying, if life is eternal, and life is eternal because life is Christ, and Christ is God, and God is only, only God is eternal, then death, which is the, op- the contradictory opposite of life, cannot be it's eternal. temporal. When exactly. I was studying the, the revelation, it talked about the lake of, of fire, uh, of fire. Yeah. and the, it's fire and theon. And theon, you know, is a, sulfur. when I read that, sulfur. I thought, okay, now that's a yeah, fascinating yeah, word because yeah, yeah. Cause it can mean sulfur, but it also is an adjective that can be a substantive yeah. and translated as divinity. Divin- divine, but, yeah. Divine. Well, that to me, opened up all sorts of doors having to do with the word Ionion and understanding the Ionion punishment that, 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 well, gosh, if the fire really is God, like scripture says, God is a consuming fire, well, then the punishment is yeah, God. So, God. This so is what, Isaac of Nineveh and Origen. Would they say, yeah, so the punishment for darkness is light. The punishment for lies is truth. The punishment for death is to be exposed to life. The punishment for for lostness is to be exposed to the way who who is Jesus and then all those problems about well in Matthew 25 the the sheep and the the goats they both one goes into the um, Ionios life and the other into the Ionios Colossan and and Talbot suggested this I, I noticed that and this makes sense to me well the Ionios life and the Ionios Colossan are the same thing. They're the Ionios fire. They're the presence of God. And, and Jesus is standing in front of the temple, and both goats and sheep would go, both the, the, the burnt offering and the sin offering would go into the same fire, which is the fire that comes down from the Father that is to be perpetual and never to go out. And so ultimately, if God is fire, and I and theosis is occurring in me, and anakephalo. I'm destined to be filled with the fire of God. So, 
like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, and it, and it burns away the evil, it purifies exactly. the it's good. Exactly, it's a purifying fire. Yeah. So ultimately, and this is, this is where I love the Bart, that well, that God's judgment and God's punishment is His grace. That the it's grace the is the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> this yeah. is what the fi the fathers have taught. It's the same thing, and this is what Origen was again insisting against the heresy of Martianite, because the Martianite were saying that either God is just or God is merciful or God is good. And and you know this is the same as Augustine is saying. Augustine yeah. was saying that God is just with some and God is good with others. Yeah. So God is good only with those who are saved and God is just with all the others who are damned. Mm -hmm. But Origen was saying no, God is both good and just at the same time and his goodness is his justice and his justice is his goodness. So now how is this manifested? First his justice is manifested in this purifying fire. So evil must be destroyed. So this is not that evil. Evil has no home uh, when God is all in all. So this is again this origin has a great argument, a very long and uh, thoroughly argued argument, uh, that uh, if God has to be all in all, and this is revealed, so we must believe that, uh, as Paul says, as St. Paul says, that God will be all in all. So this means that evil will have no place anymore, yeah. anywhere, yeah. in any soul. Because God, if, if God is there everywhere, in every soul, in, any, in every body, evil has no place because evil cannot coexist with God. They are two contradictory opposites. So either there's God or there's evil because yeah. God is good. And so he says evil will disappear, evil will vanish, will, will, will have no place anymore, and God will fill everything. But this, but this will be through the elimination of evil. But well, this, no, is, this, this, this is, is both a punishment. This, this is right. origin. Yeah. Uh, but this is both a punishment. But the punishment is a benefit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's not no. that uh, it is not a punishment that looks back without a, a positive purpose. But the punishment itself is a benefit. So we uh, Gregory of Nyssa uh, even goes beyond and, and even says in the anima through with Macrina, his sister actually speaking, and she say. We cannot even call it a punishment, it's actually a benefit, because the primary goal of God is never to even to punish. Yeah. God never even thinks of punishing, but he wants to purify. And purification, of course, had this side effect of suffering, because of course evil has to be burnt out, so to yeah. say, to be eliminated. And if the soul is kind of entangled, is re really still uh, too filled with evil, the soul will suffer through the is purification, but this is still a purification. It's not. Well, and, is not that, and is that and is that what helped me with that idea was when Paul would talk about the old man or the false oh, man yeah, or yeah, the, yeah, the of body yeah, of flesh. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, yeah. that they're, they're really so. It's very important for me to confess my sin and not identify with my sin because my sin really will be destroyed. And that that oh, yeah. that sinful self ultimately is built on a lie. But if I identify with it, the fire will burn. If I surrender it. Then the fire is sweet. The, the death of the soul is sin, and and this is this is clear. It was over, already even in Philo, and Philo uh, was of course not a Christian, but he was a Platonist and he influenced immensely the Christians. And Philo was in a way corrected by Origen because Philo was saying, um, well, if a person is dead in her or his soul uh, because he chooses evil consistently. Uh, this soul becomes annihilated. And so even if this person is still alive in the body, is really kind of dead man walking in the sense that the soul is dead and the body is still alive. And when also the body will be dead, this person will exist no more because uh, the, the soul is already dead and the body is destroyed. And so this person is annihilated totally. But Origen objected to this kind of thinking, saying no, because again, here creation comes in. God has has this powerful creative will. So if God created every single person, every single being, even an animal, but still also much human being, 
God wanted this to exist. And if this is annihilated by sin, because sin is evilness and evilness is nothingness, and so the, the, the consequence is that you go into nothingness if you consistently sin, God doesn't want that because this goes against the creative will of well, it God. Go, it, goes, it goes back to that doctrine of creation, right? Exactly. So, th so the link a, between creation and apocatastasis. Yeah. Well, and yeah. and that, yeah. that Jesus is the creative word of God. So Jesus, yeah. Yeah. the word can't yeah. return vote. Yeah. It can't return void. So the uh, a fascinating verse for me, all these verses jump out that I've never used to pay attention to before, but at the end of John 12, Jesus says, I know the Father's commandment is eternal life. And I, I love that. So so God's God's commandment will not fail and and even if I fail yeah, his command is faithful <laughs> yeah God yeah, is exactly. God is faithful yeah you, you know the the Bible verse to me that brings the whole Bible together yeah. uh, in an amazing way is Romans 11:32, which you know is the the summation of Paul's argument with vessels of wrath and mercy and Israel and and he says um, for God has consigned all men to disobedience exactly, in order. that he may have mercy yeah. on yeah. all and yeah. and to me that's like Oh, that's how the tree works, is when I, my dying is Peter Hyatt as an autonomous, self-centered, individual will must end, must fail. Yeah, exactly. But at the yeah. point where it fails, I get the beatific vision, right? That's where I realize, oh, life is not my own creation. I'm the creation of life. And then I see God as who he truly is. And then I have knowledge of the good, and I have knowledge of the evil, and I have eternal life and I've arrived at the apocatas, ap, apocatastasis and, um, and I'm joined in the anacephalio, the body of Christ, because it's, it seems that, that, that self-will is the thing that leaves, that isolates me in my own individual Hades of yeah. darkness. But when I begin to love with God's love, then I connect to everyone else and Chris's joy is my joy, your joy is my joy, your pain is my pain, and the body begins to function, and then it's time to party forever and ever and ever. That's exactly true. And you know what, what you were saying about isolation? Again, I, I can find it all in the Father's reflect, theological reflections. Uh, this self-isolation of the will, this is exactly the primal fall exactly the, the way in which many of them um, have represented this idea of detaching uh, uh, this is really the fall much before before long before the fall of adam this is the fall of satan there are um people coming at this truth of the apocatastasis from so many different angles. So for me, it's a great hope. Let's yeah, just say, yeah. for me personally, it's a, this great hope. For many fathers, it was a truth, and for many of them, it was a hope. We, we, it's really difficult to tell that apart yeah. for the fathers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. you know, you have yeah. you have people coming out of like the Southern Baptist tradition, and they'll have a whole they'll have a whole yeah. bag of problems that uh, they'll be wrestling with, and then you have the Roman Catholics with another bag of problems, and the Pentecostals with another bag, and then the Reformed guys like me with another bag of problems mm -hmm. and it's it's wonderful to see them all come together yeah. and to start to examine their bags and realize oh there is God has given each of us a gift because yeah. we're each part yeah. of his body yeah. Yeah. and when we come together Jesus becomes we see Jesus he was more and more more and more beautiful and I think the, in, the so much the encouragement from you mm -hmm. Ilaria is the realization that well there's almost like a well, there's a restoration happening in the church. Well, I would like to say two things. One is from the perspective of the cross, and the other one, uh, which is more a mystical perspective, and the other one is, again, uh, just a reflection on, you know, again, this un this holistic perspective of the fathers, this, uh, this blessing that patristic theology kept the church one. So again, I'm not surprised that they come together and they find themselves one when they are listening to the fathers because again, for me, it's a big blessing that I see, again, as a historical theologian looking at all the whole of church history in 2000 years. I also teach for instance, I taught Christology in the first millennium, I was in the second millennium, but going through the whole of, of the history of the church, you really see that as long as the church has stuck to the theology of the fathers, and really patristic theology was the theology of the church, 
the church was one. And so it's a kind of unifying theology, it's a holistic theology. And it's not surprising that is for the most part, at least in, in its, surely in its most significant uh, uh, supporters and, and voices uh, from Origen to the Cappadocians, Gregory of Nyssa, Evagrius, and Maximus the Confessor, Pseudo Dionysius, Eriugen uh, himself, uh, in, 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 his, in its most, uh, the church's most uh, um, representative and most important theologian, we find actually this doctrine. Again, uh, more or less outspoken, more or less cautiously expressed, like an origin with more hesitation, Gregor Nisa with less. It's, so it's a lot of nuances and differences, but still, uh, this doctrine uh, as a hope, as a truth, uh, as, a, uh, as, as a perspective doctrine, as the orientation of all their thought toward the telos is, is the doctrine of the, the, the first millennium church. And, and is, Eugene is like the, uh, the seal of that. At uh -huh. the end of that, from the beginning is the New Testament, at the end we see Eugene, and, uh, and we see that uh, uh, this whole patristic theology is all, again, oriented toward the telos, and this was probably uh, a reaction against uh, this infinitude of the Greek, of Greek philosophy, which kind of had no point of, uh, well, of course it had the ideal of uh, uh, disembodiment, of uh, assimilation to God, but it, it was not historically oriented in a yeah. way, it didn't have that. Uh, whereas for the fathers, it's really all this orientation toward the telos and toward theosis and apokatasis, so Apocatasis restoration is an akephaliosis or uh, this uh, recapitulation of all in Christ uh, with the end of all, uh, and is also this theosis or deification or finally finally uh, entering the life of God, which is eternal. And so the, we are also eternified in a way. We become eternal, not because we are eternal. Creatures are not eternal, but then by grace we are kind yeah, of if we're if we're filled with the substance of eternity yeah. that raises fascinating possibilities for what it means when paul says that in in ephesians when he talks about the fact that we're already seated in the heavenly places with yeah. christ yeah. that just tells me okay that yeah. it's beyond what my mind can put in a neat little box but yeah. one day the, the Time, I'm not going to be the slave of time, but time will be yeah, the servant exactly. of me. Yeah, and because because time is created by God, actually created by Christ, who is the, the creator of the Ionis. This is origin again. So, so this whole world really is absolutely upside down. Yeah, yeah. I, I would really like to think of the presence of the cross, which seems a kind of curse, instead is grace. So the presence of the cross wherever you see and is a suffering, innocent suffering, which is huge, is immense. There's a lot of that in the world, uh, and, uh, injustice. Uh, and, but this is the cross, which is, uh, which is for the salvation of the world, which is an ocean of grace. If you think of the ocean of suffering, of innocent suffering and oppression, and, and you see with others' eyes, from the eyes of Christ, this is an ocean of grace. And, and, uh, and grace is undeserved. So it's true that free will is so important, but it's oriented to the good. And, so, and grace is one step farther. And so grace is undeserved as well. So grace is for, the, and grace is for the salvation. So yeah. uh, of course, in a way, none of us deserve salvation. Yeah. And so it's always a work of grace. Yeah, and I'm never, I'm never, truly free until I'm at peace with the realization that everything is a gift and exactly. then I'm and then yeah. I'm free it's yeah. the charisma to teu, teutodorum this is uh, origin quoted saint paul saying that the work of salvation itself is a gift from God. It's charisma to teu, teu uh, It is God who gives you this gift in a gratuitous way. Yeah. And, and so it's a, it's, a, it's a subtle equilibrium, so to say, between the importance of free will, which is for all these fathers paramount, again, in this anti-Valentinian polemic, etc., but also the keen awareness that salvation comes through grace. And this is already in origin. Of course, Augustine uh, stressed it a lot, but, uh, they both Origen and Augustine agree totally on that, that salvation is a work of grace. Was, because so I've thought of it this way, and I don't know if they would say it this way, that, that, that my, my free will doesn't create salvation. Mm -hmm. Salvation creates my free will. Yeah, and exactly. it's getting those two yeah. backwards is what 
yeah. lands me in the outer yeah. darkness. <laughs> that, that, no, that, that's that's exactly exactly the case. Is a, a free will by itself is not enough, and the the gift of eternal life and even of theosis. This is again origin thinking of this enormous gift is so huge that has, it has no measure. So it cannot be uh, kind of measured up against our merits because, uh, uh, again, this is also the reason why Origen, for instance, was arguing, but also the, the Antiochians argued, that what can be measured, against, measured up against our merits, uh, according to our merits, uh, in proportion to our merits, uh, is uh, maybe punishment or purification for the sins, this can be in a way be counted or, or still have a measure, uh, but eternal life, participation in the life of God, theosis, uh, this, uh, this reward which is not a reward for anything, we, we, cannot, we could never have done something so good, we could never have merit deserts enough to to be uh, to to be worthy of the immense grace uh, of the immense gifts that God will well, give and, us. And it seems like it seems to me that's like a bottom line idea that that grace is boundless. Exactly. That, that, and, exactly. And it I has no measure with, with and August, no end. Yeah, yeah. With Augustine, yeah. that yeah. came in this idea that well, God is fifty percent grace and fifty percent justice and. And, but the testament of the fathers is no, he's just absolute free love, yeah. which, which is which is grace. That's yeah. so beautiful. So, Elaria, we bless you. We thank you, and uh, thank we you. pray that the the next book would be a great success. And we look forward to the to the shorter version. Oh yeah. Even though 911 is a great number of pages, but <laughs> maybe 77 or something like that would be a, a good number. Could be shorter. And, yes, readable. Uh, yeah. yeah.